Um, this morning, if I can have my, who are my ushers? I'm going to get you, Bill, and Terry Carson, and Wayne, if you want to. Uh, Camden, let me get you too, buddy. Um, we're going to hand these out. Now, I would bend over and pick them up, but my back's torqued a little bit. If you don't mind, I'm not trying to be bossy, if you can just hand those out. And uh, if you're a member, I want to make sure every member gets one. So if you're a member, raise your hand if you're a member. All right. I think we'll have enough for, for them and then some. So I think we're good. Um, what this is, church, is our prayer directory. Remember, we talked about we're just going to be doing baby steps this year. And uh, this is your prayer directory. Now, there's if you look in your prayer directory, there's a page right there at the beginning that's been inserted. We want you to pray for those people every day. I'm teasing. Those were people... Those are people that um, were not included. They were in a new members class. It consists of Tyler Gill, the Harmons, uh, the Hardys, and Ronnie and Hope Thomas. Um, I'm going to use them as a bookmark as I pray through this. And I want to encourage you to pray through this book. Now, how you do that is up to you. You can pray through this book every day. Some of us have time we can do that. Uh, every week, every month, maybe every, every year you work through this book. Um, I'm going to purpose to pray through this book. And every time I pray for you all, I'm going to put a little mark on that line under your picture and, and do that. Now, here's the thing that I want to try to incorporate this year. And I'm going to do this in the sermon today. And I know it's the Lord's Supper. Um, I want you to pray about what things God shows you in His Word. I want you to pray for uh, unity. I want you to pray for um, that you'll grow in the knowledge of God. I'm going to talk to you about some things that I'm going to be praying for y'all this year, and I hope that y'all will pray for each other as well. It's found in Colossians. And it starts in, let's just for time's sake, let me just, uh, we'll start at verse 3. I'll explain this because what I have found out is when you look through the New Testament, uh, God has started driving me back to His Word in a very forceful way. And what I am recognizing is much of what we hold to, much of what we say, much of what we do doesn't line up with Scripture. We think it does. Some of us have perspectives on things we think line up and they don't. And I'm doing something I haven't done in quite a while. I'm going back to the original Greek like I did when I first came here to really study. And I'm going to try to help us learn together as we go through this. But I have noticed that the prayers in the New Testament do not really match what we pray for in church. I talked to Pam this week about that when we met about worship. Uh, we pray about physical things, financial things, and circumstances. And, and unfortunately most of the time it's all about who? Me. And it's nothing wrong with praying that. The Lord's Prayer is it covers those things. Give us today our daily bread. Deliver us from, uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So it's talking about food and circumstances and all that. But when you read what the apostles prayed, they prayed things like this. Let's look. Because hopefully we will become people that are not so much man-centered. And that's where we start. But God wants to grow us out of that. Look at verse 3. This is the background to the prayer. We give thanks to God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Why are they giving thanks and why are they praying? Since we've heard these two things about you. We've heard about your faith in Christ and all your love for the saints, or and of your love for all the saints. Verse 5, now why do they have this faith in Jesus and this love for the saints? Because of the hope. Now, hope, church, when he talks about it because of hope, that's, that's something that keeps us from distraction. Um, when I'm coming home from a long vacation, I'm looking forward to getting home and, and relaxing, and my hope is I'm going to get home. That's all that's on my brain. Or for some of y'all, when, when Rogue One, the Star Wars movie, came out and y'all saw the trailer, it was all about the hope of that day. And all you could think about was, what, Josh, were you think about that day when I'm going to sit there and watch it? And that's, it keeps us from distraction. Their hope, 
that's motivating them in their faith in Christ and their love for the saints, their hope is which is laid up in heaven. And this is a very powerful statement in the Greek, not so much in the English, but in the Greek. In the Greek is a past perfect tense. Larry, you're boring us. I don't know what Greek is. Let me tell you what that means. Their hope is in something that happened in the past that has been forever done and forever will be and cannot change. Their hope is not in what they're going to get. Their hope isn't in their reward. Their hope is not that I'm not going to hell but going to heaven. Their hope is in what Christ has done and laid up for them in heaven. It's already done. And that's where their hope is, which means their hope cannot be taken what? Away. It's something that happened in the past that has been made perfect in the future, and it cannot be removed. That's where their hope is. Of which you have heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Their hope is in what God has done for them in Jesus Christ, which has come to you as it is also in the world. They've received it, but it's also going out in the world. And listen, this gospel is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God and truth, as you have also learned from, apra, um, I'll say this wrong, I've got it written phonetically, Nikki, Aperparis, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, who has declared to us the love in the Spirit. What he's saying is this, these people know, are known by their faith, and they're known by their love. They are motivated by what Jesus has done for them. That's their hope. And the gospel that they believed in, which is their hope, is producing fruit where they are. They're secured by Jesus. It was heard by a sinner. They procured it as believers. It is now theirs, and nothing can take it away. And when you have that kind of hope, no matter what you go through, that's your hope. My hope isn't about here. My hope is about there. Now, here's the prayer. For this reason. Now, does it sound like they're in trouble or are they doing well? They're doing well. So here's the prayer. He's saying, I'm hearing such good things about you. This is what we do sometimes. You're doing so well, we probably don't need to pray for you. That's not what Paul says. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you. And to ask that you may be filled with of his in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. The first thing that Paul prays for is that they would be filled with the knowledge of the will of God. God has a desire for you to know his will. He is not hiding it like the Easter Bunny and you have to go find it. He is not trying to camouflage it so you have to. It is his desire for you to know his will. And Paul is saying, I am praying that you will be filled with the knowledge of his what? Will. You can't walk in God's will if you don't know it. Would you agree? So when I say, what is God's will for your marriage? What is God's will for your parenting? What is God's will for you at work? What is God's will for you as you go through life? What is God's will for you at Walmart? God wants us to be filled with the knowledge of his will. In Deuteronomy, God says this, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may all know the words of his law. When Paul uses this word filled, he is not talking about a cup that's filled up. That's what we use in churches. It's a horrible illustration. It's a, let me say it again. It's a horrible illustration. Because it misleads people. If you can fill the cup, you can also what? That is not what it's talking about. When it says filled with the knowledge or filled with the spirit or filled with his word, it's not talking about being filled to the brim. That word filled means this, the driving force, the main influence, that which governs, that's what you are driven by. So when it says don't be filled with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. That doesn't mean you done filled it up to the brim. It means what is 
driving you or governing you or influencing you. I shared this in our men's group today. I've been drunk once in my entire life. And let me share something with you. Some of you don't ever need to touch it because like me, the first time you touch it, it owns you. Some of y'all, God says this about alcohol. Is it a sin to drink? No. But God does say this about alcohol. It's like a viper. You can handle a viper. You can play with a viper. And that viper may not bite you, but if it bites you, you're in what? It bit me. And when I got drunk, I enjoyed it too much. I have to stay away from it. The thing is, you don't know when the viper's going to what? Bite. Now, I'm this kind of drunk. You ready? I'm confessing my sin to you. I love you, man. Robert, I love you. I love you. Now, what is happening is I am no longer being governed or influenced or controlled by my intellect. I'm being controlled by something else. I'm being controlled by what? And it has lowered my inhibitions, and I will say things and do things under that control and influence I wouldn't do otherwise. When Paul says, don't be filled with wine, what he's saying is don't be controlled, don't be governed, don't be owned, don't let it guide you, but be filled with the Spirit. So that means to be governed and controlled. So when he says that about God's will, he's saying your life should be governed and influenced and controlled by God's will. And God wants you to know it. Paul also, we're going to talk about this a little bit next week when we talk about praying for the lost people and witnessing. God also says some of these people have a zeal without knowledge. Let me explain what that means. My daughter comes home one day and says, hey, I'm on my way home. I want you to meet Michael. Well, who's Michael? I met Michael. I want you to meet him. He's a boy I like, Daddy. Okay. Michael comes in, meet, we have lunch, we sit down, we talk to Michael, Michael leaves, and this is all made up, by the way. Don't try to guess if it's Michelle and Nikki, because it's neither one of them. But Michael leaves, and my daughter turns to me and says, we're getting married. When did you meet him? Yesterday. <laughs> well, what does he do for work? I don't know what he does for work. Well, where'd you meet him? Well, he borrowed some money from me at 7-Eleven to get something to eat. <laughs> um, what's his family like? I don't know his family. Well, sweetie, how do you know you're going to marry him? Why are you trying to steal my joy, Daddy? I love him. Sweetie, I think you need to slow up. I think you're crazy. You're trying to ruin this for me. No, sweetie, I'm trying to save your life. No, you're not. That's zeal without knowledge. That is zeal with that. Would you all agree? Yeah. A couple years ago, many years ago, we had a ministry come into this area and they did a wonderful thing. They asked all our churches to come together and meet with them. And this is how the meeting went. We would like to start a ministry here. We want our churches to partner together and work together. And um, we would like you to be a part of our ministry. Well, what is your ministry? Well, we're going to try to minister to the kids that need something to do in this area. That's great. What's your doctrinal statement? Oh, we have no doctrinal statement. It's just about Jesus. Okay, I can. All right. Well, what, what way are you going to do this? We don't know yet. We're letting Jesus lead us. And one of the pastors asked a very good question. Which Jesus are you talking about? And this is their response. I can, con I can see that you're not filled with the Spirit and you don't know what God's doing, so we're not going to use We're not going to. We're fine. That ministry isn't working now. That was zeal without What? That is no different than a boy coming in and saying, Dad, I'm going to marry him because I met him and I just feel the love. Paul is saying here, I want you to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. I don't want you to be zealous for God without knowledge. Paul knew this better than anybody else because Paul persecuted and tried to destroy the church of Jesus Christ in the name of who? God. And Jesus met him on the road to Damascus and knocked him off the horse. And that's where Paul said, Who are you, Lord? 
Do we struggle with this, church? I do. I do. I struggle with this. Now, Paul tells us why he wants us to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Look at verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. There are times in my life that I don't know the will of God. But it's not because God doesn't want me to know it. I think it's because God doesn't God knows I'm not going to submit to it. And why is he going to reveal anything if I refuse to submit? Why would he come and say, "This is my will for you, Larry. This is what I want you to do." And he knows I'm not even going to listen. And so there's times in our life where God is very, and all of us have this, where he's, raise your hand if you've ever felt this way, where God's very silent. See, we've all gone, to, and oftentimes what I think God may be doing, and this is just my opinion, I think God is trying to get our attention. And he's trying to slow us up. He's trying to get us to seek his face. He's trying to get us to return back to him. And I have found this out true in my life. And when I get to a point where I say, God, wherever you lead, I will go. Will you go if I say quit the ministry and go work at Walmart in town? Well, Lord, that's be a little hard. It's not the question of schools. Yeah, I'll go. All right, how about if you just work in the soup kitchen? You going to be able to handle that? Yeah, yeah, I go. What if I move you away from your grandchild? And until I'm ready to go, wherever you lead, I'll go. Sometimes that silence stays. But once my heart's ready, isn't this true, honey? <coughs> this is what it is, schools. And he shouts it to me and I hear it because he knows I am now ready to what? Wherever you lead, I will go. When I know God's will, then I walk. Here's the second point. I walk worthy and fruitfully. That word worthy doesn't mean like a merit or earning or a way that is deserving. This is what it means. It's a powerful Greek word. It means I walk balanced. I walk balanced. The reason I did not come to Christ was because there was a Christian that I knew that was the only, like, outside my family Christian that I knew, and they were way out of balance. They were very critical, very fault-finding, very, uh, and, and my family will know who this is as soon as I start talking about them. They may be here. No makeup, no TV, no radio, no this, no that, no on this day, no on that. No, that's all I knew. That, they were out of balance. And I was like, I'm not, I can't do that. Could you do that, Camden? It's, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a bondage. And I said, if that's what Christianity is, I don't want it. There's another group that gets out of balance, and, and it's all experience and all what God's told me and this, that, and the other, and they're a little fruity. We call them the born again, and they've hijacked that word. <coughs> God says a person that knows God's will will walk in such a balanced way it will present fruit around them. Am I making sense, church? Are y'all tracking with me? Listen, when we see a Christian that says one thing and then acts another way, that causes confusion. When as parents we favor one over the other because we don't like this one or that one, it, it sends a confusing message. When we as, as a pastor or a Sunday school teacher say we shouldn't do this and then in the hall before we get to worship we're doing it. It sends a mixed message. God says if you know my will you will walk in such a balanced way those things won't happen. You'll present fruit in your life. God wants us to know his will and he wants us to walk in a balanced way. I shared this with my men this morning in the men's group. He's talking about the spirit filled life really isn't he? And the spirit-filled life is not about getting more of God. 
Let me say that again. The spirit-filled life is not about getting more of God. God has given you everything you need because his word says he's done that. If you are seeking more, you don't understand what you have. The question isn't, does God have, you want more of God. The question is, does God have more of you? And the reason you're not experiencing God and experience him in a deep way is because you read his word and it doesn't mean anything. Pray for your enemies. I'm not going to pray for them. I'll talk trash about them at the restaurant. And you grieve the spirit of God and you wonder why God feels so far away. Because he's told you, this is my will. Pray for those. And you're trash talking them. And the waitress visited your church last week. And she saw you and she knows what you do in the church and she has now left. <coughs> because you thought it was funny and you wouldn't submit to my word. And instead of praying for him, you made fun of him to somebody who knows where you go to church. <coughs> Hitting close to home this morning, aren't I? We looked in our men's group today. It says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. That is, the, that is God's will for the Christian. And if I am filled with that knowledge and I go to Pam to talk trash about Marion Acres, in that moment, God will remind me of that verse. Let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. And in that minute, if I repent... I'm not going to do that. Now I'm walking a balanced life and it produces fruit. This is what God says. God is not mocked. What a man sows, he will reap. We are either going to sow in the spirit or we're going to sow in the flesh. We know when we sow in the flesh, it brings all kinds of horrible things, divisiveness, slander, gossip, filthy communication, debauchery, all these things, and it brings death. But if we sow in the Spirit, we know it brings love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and it brings life. And church, your pastor is not perfect. I am not preaching down to you. You, can, you have permission to do this. You can go to my daughters, and my daughters can tell you this. That's where daddy sowed in the spirit. And that's where daddy sowed in the flesh. That's where daddy sowed in the spirit. That is where daddy sowed in the flesh. And if you ask them, how did this affect you? They'll say, let me tell you. How did this affect you? Let me tell you. And I am very proud of my sowing in the spirit. I am often haunted over and over again about my sowing in the flesh. If I know God's will... And we need to be praying this for each other, that we may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. And this is the last one. If I walk in a worthy manner, I will be strengthened. I went to a conference yesterday. Frankie Johnson asked me to go, and I went with him. I had a wonderful day. He blessed me. He blessed me so much, got me in trouble with my wife. Because uh, this is what I said to my wife, and it, and it was joking, but, but this was what I said. I said, man, it was such a wonderful day. And all my wife was thinking, really? <laughs> yeah. I had a wonderful day. And as we were leaving, there was all this traffic, and, and I thought, Frankie heard my sermon, Michelle. He had to have, because there was a guy wanting to get in line, and this is what Frankie did. He's walking worthy, and that strengthens me to want to walk worthy. He encouraged me. He builds me up. He challenged me. Um, I had a waitress come to me the other day ask about one of y'all. And she said, do they go to your church? I said, they do. Now, when I said that, I went like this. <laughs> so I asked myself this question. Did they sow in the spirit or did they sow in the flesh? So it's going to be a good witness or a bad witness. And she began to talk about this couple and how they're one of the good ones, and how she looks forward to them coming in. She leave, they leave a good tip. 
and that ministered to her. That was a witness to her. I heard a great story from Joey Reinhardt while he was at the uh, hospital with EA, and uh, they were talking to one of, it's either one of the nurses or the doctors up there. It was one of the staff people at the hospital. He began to talk about his trip down the Tappahannock years and years and years ago and how he had uh, taken a boat down there to go fishing. He'd been looking forward to it. He hooked his boat up, drove all the way down to Garrett's Marina. He got down there, and he realized he left the motor back at home. And there was a tall, skinny man there and uh, came over and saw his dilemma. They began to talk, and that man told him, a complete stranger, you can use my motor. I've got a motor over in the shed. Just go over and grab it, put it on your boat, use it, and when you're done, put it back. That man was just amazed that somebody would do that. He, he has very fond memories of Tappahannock and asked Joey if everybody in Tappahannock's like that. And Joey said it used to be, <laughs> not anymore. But he asked and found out what that man's name was, and that man's name was Whit Garrett. Now, Whit wasn't being foolish. He, he trusted this guy to do that. But Whit was walking worthy. So Joey, here's walking in the man that's worthy. Joey, looking for an opportunity to serve, went to Garrett's Marina yesterday and tried to get him a, a, a Garrett's Marina hat, and they couldn't find one. We're going to get Larry. Uh, is it on there? It's on now. All right. So Joey goes goes back, goes to the marina, looks for a hat. Him and Lewis Muse start digging around for a hat. They finally found a blaze orange hat. The only one they could find. He took it to the guy. That guy was tickled pink. When we do little things like that that the world is not used to seeing, we are walking in the knowledge of his will. We're walking worthy in a balanced way and we start to produce fruit in our life and our ministry. That make sense? Joey's got a witnessing opportunity now. He doesn't know I'm going to push him to that. Look at verse 11. When we do that, we're strengthened with all might. How many of y'all would like to feel more secure and strengthened as you navigate life? It says, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins. It starts with the gospel, and it ends with the gospel. Often, when God reveals his will, it takes a long time to get there. Let me give you some examples. Israel knew when they went into Egypt, they would be leaving Egypt. Because Joseph told them, when you leave here, you're going to take my bones to the land that was shown to the forefathers. They knew that. Moses even knew he was going to be the deliverer before the burning bush. You don't think so. Look in the book of Acts. That's why he killed the Egyptians. The Bible says he killed the Egyptians and hoped that the Hebrews would recognize he was their deliverer. He was doing, trying to do God's work in the flesh. And it cost him 40 years. Do you know how long Israel waited from knowing they were going to leave to when they left? 400 years. David, we anoint you king over Israel. Oh, by the way, it's going to be 15 years before that happens. God didn't tell him that part. Jesus, I'm sending you into the world to die for sinners. It took him how long to accomplish that? 33 years. And we'll pray for a lost person and we lose patience after four weeks. Or God shows us what he wants done and we get upset it's not happening. And so you know what? We do like Abraham and Sarah. What did Abraham and Sarah do after God said, I'm going to give you a child? They did it their way. And God will let us do it in the flesh. And they had a fleshly child called, what was his name? 
And who came from the Israel? Oh, that's right, the Arab, the Middle East problems we have today. Because he sowed in the flesh. Listen, this will scare you too. If I sow in the spirit, it goes on for generations. And if I sow in the flesh, it goes on for what? What I want y'all to begin to pray for is that while we're being strengthened, we can wait on God. The best compliment I've ever gotten from one of my professors and Glenn Hayden was there. Where's Glenn Hayden? We were talking to Dr. Coley and I was sharing something very private that God had laid on my heart. And I said, we just have to wait. And it was the best compliment I've ever gotten from anybody. And I respect Coley. He said, it took me a long time to learn that lesson. Some of y'all haven't learned that lesson yet. Those who wait upon the Lord will lose their patience. They shall mount up with anger and take matters into their own hands. Is that what the Bible says? <laughs> and while they're serving, let me read you the prayer Jesus prayed. This is the Lord's Prayer. It's John 17. Father, the hour has come to glorify your son, and your son may also glorify you. As you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. And now, O oh Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He prays for himself, but it's in the context of, I want to do your will. And everything that you revealed to me, I've finished. And he prays for his disciples. I have manifested your names to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you, for which I have given to them the words which you gave to me. And they have received them, and they know surely that I've come forth from you. And they believe that you, that, that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I have come to you, Father, the Holy Father. Keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be, listen, that they may be one as we are one. And while I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. And those who you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled but now I come to you with these things and I speak in the world that they may be that they may have my joy and it may be full I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I'm not of the world I do not pray that they should be taken out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one prayed saying they know your word like I knew your word I have finished a work they will finish a work I pray that you not take them out of the world but they would be in the world but that they would not become like the world the Colossians had a faith that was spoken of throughout the area and they had a love for one another they were one with each other because they were one with Christ. If God loved you so much that despite yourself and despite your sinfulness and despite all the horrible things you've done, God loved you so much that he sent his son to die in your place, why do you think he's trying to hide his will from you? It may not be hiding his will. It may be you're not wanting to submit to it. Jesus submitted to God's will, and as he was in the garden, he knew what God's will was. He prayed to the Father, 
and he walked worthy, and it bore much fruit. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that we could imitate your son, that even when we know hard things, things that we'd have to die to ourselves for, things that we would have to give up things for, things that we'd, Father, some of us, that we'd have to give up control. For the pastor, sometimes it's just things they have to die to and wait. Father, I pray that we would walk worthy, that we would see that what we're struggling with and what we need to know the reason we don't know it isn't because you don't love us and it's father it's not even because satan's blinding us the problem is us i pray we'd be like george Mueller, your great servant that we would lose our will and your will that we could be like your son that would say not my will be done but your will be done and trusting you to walk in it no matter how bad it seems, trusting in the fruit on the other side. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. In the Lord's Prayer in John 17, he goes on to pray for you and me. And, and when I say that, that's exactly who this prayer was for. It says, I do not pray, talking about the disciples, I do not pray for these alone, but also those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. That's the witness of the church is the unity. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I and them and you and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them and you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, the ones you gave me, may be with me where I am, that's our hope, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you've loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. I've declared to them your name, and they will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Do you know what he prays for after that? Lord, if there's any other way, this cup can depart from me. That's the next prayer. He's in the garden and he asked his friends to pray with him. And what did they do? Y'all know church, what they do? They fell asleep. Spirit was willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. Can we as a church family pray for each other and pray things like this? and trust in God for the fruitfulness of it. We're all struggling, amen? And God says, I want you to know my will, I want you to walk in it. But it really does begin with his people praying and turning back to him. Let me share with us what God has shown me about this cup this week. This cup should be a forever reminder of the love that God has for you and for me. I quote this verse at weddings, there's no greater love than this, than a man lay down his life for his what? For his friend. And Jesus laid down his life in order that the enemies of God could become friends of God and friends of him. And then his prayer was that we could be one just like the Father and the Son are one. The motivations of the Colossians and even the motivation of what Christ is, as we get ready to share this gospel with people around us, our motivation for sharing that has to be and must be love. It cannot be fear, it cannot be manipulation.
That is not how Jesus did it. That's not how the Colossians did it. Let me share why I'm sharing that. I can pray, and I do pray for my children and my grandchildren and my family. I've got family members that don't know Christ on both sides, and, and I want to be praying for them. But I can pray this way. God, I pray they don't burn in hell. Please don't let them burn in hell. Don't let them go to burn in hell. Please don't let them burn in hell. That's, that's a great prayer. If I'm sharing the gospel so they don't burn in hell, what's my motivation? What is it, church? Say it. Let's not be embarrassed. Fear. There is something more powerful than fear, and I can tell you how I know that. If there is a house that is on fire and about to collapse, and a dad hears a baby inside, and he knows it's his little boy, what does daddy do? Because love is far more powerful than fear. Our hope is what is in store. And when I share the gospel with people, I'm hoping they will receive it because I want to spend eternity with them. I want them to see the glory of my Savior. And I want them to know the perfect will of God. That is a far better motivation. Amen. Let me ask you this. Is hell real? Absolutely. For those that reject it, we'll be sent there. But let it not be the motivation while we're sharing the gospel. Let it be because somebody loved me enough to share it with me. Hopefully I can love someone enough to share it with what? Them. Let's pray. Father, we hold this little plastic cup. And Father, there, there are even some young people that look forward to the grape juice. And Father, forgive us that we take this cup so lightly. It is a reminder of the horrible cost and the horrible price that our sin brought into this world and brought upon ourselves. That the Holy Son of God would have to die in order that we could have life. And Father, if you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son, Father, can we not love the world enough to share the gospel? Father, can we not love you enough to stop doing those things we know displease you? And Father, you saved us, so there's some things in our life we need to stop doing. Help us to repent, Father. Help us to seek your face and turn from our wicked ways. Help us to humble ourselves and pray. Help us to take the gospel first to ourselves and then into the world. I thank you for a love that a man would lay down his life and then be able to call him friend. A man who did not seek you, who you said was an enemy that was hostile toward you and you love me enough to save me and forgive me for not loving those around me enough to share with them. Help us, Father, to be evangelistic in our church. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. I don't know, church, if you missed me, but I missed you. And, um, just like every speaker that we have come, I hear good, bad, and ugly. But I heard, heard more good than bad, so we're going to have him back. He's an evangelist. Could you pick that up? He's an evangelist, and he does revivals. And uh, I called everybody and their uncle, and everybody was busy except him. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't know him right well. I said, please come. And so he came, so we're going to have him back. Church. As we stand and hold hands today, before we sing, I know we're running a little long, 10 minutes, not bad. Um, we're going to stand and sing, blessed be the tie that bind, but we're going to pray before we do that. And then after we sing, we're going to hug our brothers and sisters in Christ and remind ourselves we are one. So Pam, can you get ready to, blessed be the tie that bind, and we'll, let's stand and hold hands. Let's pray. And then we'll sing.